Good morning and welcome. It's great to see each of you here via the internet. Hope you'll stand with us and let's sing together. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Makes me love everybody. Makes me love everybody makes me love everybody it's good enough for me give me that old time religion give me that old time religion give me that old time religion it's good enough for me just a closer Oh, 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 oh,
listen as the trio sings. Questions come to my mind. What is waiting ahead for me and the rest of mankind? Fear not tomorrow. God is already there. He's glad for that. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm glad of that. We're, we welcome you to our service and hope that you enjoy being a part uh, this time for our offering, and I want to encourage you to do that. If you have children, you can check out on our Facebook page for some activity pages and their pre-recorded lessons, and you can uh, get those there, download them, print them out for your children, and uh, ho hopefully they will enjoy that. I think you'll really enjoy Brother Dale's lesson today. Um, it was really good. Our discipleship group continues to meet via Zoom meeting at 7 p.m. on Wednesday night. And perhaps next week, 
Um, we might be able to have a preaching service online on Wednesday night as well. Uh, we're trying to work that out, but I'll uh, let you know about that. Uh, we hope to get back to services just as soon as we possibly can. And uh, when we do that, we will let you know via our website or on the SK Notify for those of you to do that. There are three ways for you to give. You can do that through our website at ccfwb.org and just click the donate button, or you may text to give by uh, dialing 480-418-5357. If you need envelopes, we can get envelopes that are postage paid and bring those to you or send those to you. You just let us know. Either call the church number or call me on my cell phone, and we'll get that taken care of for you. I want you to listen to a song Dolores wrote, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you. you. 
Sister Dara for that song. Welcome again to our online service. Some of you at home are wondering how Pastor Howard was able to change that quickly from his gray suit to his black suit, but that's through the magic of video editing and things we were able to record earlier. To take your Bibles to John chapter 18, we're going to be there in just a minute, but we're going to be talking about finding truth in a world of fake news and a look into some of these things. But first, I want to show some uh, just a little bit of humor I found, and I'm not trying to make light of the, the situation or the seriousness of the disease or those that have lost loved ones or anything, but you've got to laugh or you've got to cry, and I'd rather laugh every now and then. And uh, So it just shows some things that I found. Here was a, a church thing of social distancing baptistry uh, that they were able to come up with. You've th- you got to stand six feet away and throw the ball to get people baptized, so uh, we may implement that if this continues on. Our We've got uh, people locked up at home, so one guy made a Minecraft video game church there that he built, and he goes into that while he watches his church live stream, so I thought that was kind of clever. Our uh, one church was able to still continue to do potlucks. It says here, Baptist pastor told me this morning that with the virus going around, they've been doing potlucks on Facebook Live. He's just been having people drop off chicken and banana pudding at the fellowship hall and then broadcasts himself eating it. So uh, we may have to go to that as well if this continues on for a couple weeks. And then my favorite of all is that we're able to announce a new giving method. I'm excited that we are able to take the new form of currency that our country has, which is rolls of toilet paper, are quite a store of value. And so uh, anytime you pick up at least 10, one of those needs to go to the church as your tithe. So if you want to send that to us, uh, if you need a box, we will send you a box. And or if you want to drop that off at the church, anyway, we will, uh, we will take that as your form of tithes and things there. So let's look at God's word. Uh, John chapter 18. This is Jesus before the Roman governor Pilate here, and a pilot is questioning him. A pilot's trying to play the political game. He doesn't want to crucify Jesus, but he's got people to satisfy, and the crowd wants Jesus dead, and all these things. And so, Pilot keeps questioning Jesus over and over, trying to find a loophole out of this. And in John chapter 18, verse 37, it says, Pilot therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Pilate asks an age-old question people have been asking ever since history began. What is truth? How can we know what is true and what is not true? And yet the irony is that he does not stick around for the answer. He asks The man, he asked Jesus, truth in a person, God come down in the flesh. He asked the very man who is truth himself, and yet he walks out as soon as he asks that question, scoffingly, what is truth? And Pilate walks away and does not stay for the man most equipped of all to give the answer of what is truth. And here uh, in our world, there's so much strange things going around, and you hear so many conflicting reports, and it's hard to decide what is truth, what can we believe? And let's look at what God's word tells us for sure. 
of what is completely reliable. And again, I'm not trying to make light of these things, but there are a lot of questions and there's a lot of conflicting information going around of why is it that COVID-19 and coronavirus is so different from everything that we've had before. We've had so we've had Ebola, we've had SARS, H1N1, swine flu, all the whole list of things there. And yet and, and some of those have affected a lot of people, and some of those have been just as deadly, and yet it's, this is so, what is so different about this that we've had to shut down the entire world economy for this one? You know, it just raises some questions of, their, of who do we believe? Who is worth believing in these things? And you hear all this information of one guy in a doctor suit or a lab coat says, yes, you need to wipe down your groceries when they come home or wipe down your Amazon packages and things. And then another one, in a white coat and a doctor suit says, no, you don't need to wipe down your packages. Well, which one do you believe? <laughs> this one's a respected authority. He says, do it. This one says, don't do it. Who do you believe in these things? Of uh, The CDC says, yes, wear a mask. That'll prevent the spreading of the disease. And the World Health Organization says, no, don't wear a mask. <laughs> Two strong authorities. Which one do you believe there? But one of those is being defunded, by the way, and that might have something to do uh, with those things. But yeah, all of these these numbers that are out there of what, you know, what is the infection rate? They were saying it was way high at this, and then the numbers are coming way lower. Uh, does it affect young people? Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. All these things. Uh, what is the mortality rate? Uh, who do you believe? And so much of this that we see around, people are trying to buy in to establish themselves as an authority. Say, I am worth you believing me. I am worth you listening to me as truth. I am credible, whether it's a, a news anchor or a politician or, you know, whatever, a doctor on TV, whoever it is, they're trying to say, I am credible. I am worth believing. And yet there's so many conflicting things. Who should we listen to in all of these things? And especially uh, with all the, everyone's all excited about their stimulus and the things that are going around and the politicians, they named it the CARES Act. We care for you. We want to take care of you. We want to help ordinary Americans. Is that really what they're doing? Are they actually lining the pockets of their corporate cronies and lobbyists with all of these things of uh, the CARES Act that went through Congress was uh, $2 trillion in itself. But then what they don't say very much is that the Federal Reserve has also authored to give an additional four trillion dollars in loans to small businesses and big mostly to big businesses and things as well that's six trillion dollars just created out of thin air we live in an economy that does 20 trillion dollars a year and we're just going to drop six trillion dollars out of nowhere and see what happens to that uh, but oh we want to help the little guy we want to help you uh, with all of these things and it's just mind-blowing of so much of this and people are like, yeah, the, you know, the government should pay people's mortgages and pay people's rents and all these things. And they don't understand as an entity in and of itself, a government does not have money. I mean, we can form a, a government or a city or a corporation. That doesn't have money in and of itself. A government, the only way the government gets money is by taxes, you know, taking money from people, or by debt, by bonds, which is just taxes delayed, taxes on the unborn, the future generations. Those are the only ways government can get money. So all this, oh, free stuff, and I got my stimulus and things. That, but oh, we care for you, while the lobbyists and the big corporations are just lining their pockets so much in this irresponsibility that's being rewarded. We see uh, Delta Airlines when uh, all this, and I know the airlines have been hit hard through these things, but they had no savings when any of this started. When the crisis started, Delta Airlines had enough money Y'all know Dave Ramsey and all the financial gurus, they say, you know, six months, have six months of emergency fund, be ready for uh, when the expenses happen, because emergencies like we're in now, they happen and you need savings. When this started, Delta Airlines, which was the healthiest, had 45 days of money on hand, an emergency fund of 45 days, and yet they're getting 60 some million dollars from the Congress and things to uh, keep themselves afloat with all this. And yet, uh, and it's not that they didn't make money, it's that over the last 10 years, every cent of profit that they have made, they have poured into executive bonuses and stock bonuses, thanks, because executive compensation is based on stock price. And they poured it into that. And yet, they have no uh, completely irresponsible financial management, but they get rewarded by free government money, and they have no incentive to not do this because they know Uncle Sam is there. Uncle Sam's going to pick up the tab. Six trillion dollars out of nowhere. We want to help you. Is that really what they're doing? Or is it just, oh, you get your $1,200. So you're distracted. Look over here while we're being a huge corporate bailout over here. But we want to we keep you distracted over here. 
we see so many of these things. The, the Federal Reserve is taking unprecedented measures. They're buying car loans now, credit card debt, all kinds of things, but buying anything that the banks don't want to hold on to. And uh, people are just all worried about the virus when we have no idea there's a complete reshuffling of the entire world financial system going on underneath us while we speak. Is it, who do you believe? And don't just take my word for it. If you're interested in these things, look it up. But who do we believe? And do we believe the politicians when they say they want to help? Or are they really just trying to help their corporate friends and so much of these things that we see around? And it's just sad that in 12 years, we've had to have two bailouts for the corporations for irresponsible behavior. And those that sacrifice and save, they get punished by inflation and those that are completely irresponsible and spend like crazy and have way too much debt, they get rewarded and they get bailed out over and over again. It's aggravating. And then, of course, the elephant in the room is that uh, this is an election year. Oh, that has nothing to do with it, nothing whatsoever, that this is an election year and all the, uh, the shutdown and everything. That uh, a complete coincidence that uh, the Democratic governor of Virginia has, at the end of March, put their state on stay-at-home lockdown until June 10th. June 10th, that is, when the Republican gubernatorial primary is on June 9th. That's a complete coincidence. Those things had nothing to do with each other whatsoever. Complete. There's no, how dare you accuse these politicians of trying to enrich themselves or use this as an opportunity to feel their own eagles, egos and go on this trip. Uh, some of these governors and these mayors are just acting like little dictators, and I think they're enjoying it quite a bit, and people are letting them go as far as they will. And just rolling over and saying, yes, you know, any power that you want, suspend our rights, do everything, take everything away from us. And they, uh, they are more than willing to do that. Or it can't be that we've got an election in November. When are things going to get back to normal? Second Tuesday in November is what I'm saying. But it can't be that politicians are just falling over themselves. Who can give away the most free stuff before the election? Oh, here's free stuff from this side. Here's free stuff from this side. You know, please vote for us. All of these things that are going on. And then, uh, of course, there's the, uh, the numbers from the Chinese Communist Party. They're out of China. And, and this is nothing against the ordinary citizens of China. They have suffered more than anyone else under the dicta dictatorship and the totalitarian regime of the Communist Party. But uh, the Communist Party, they are not to be trusted. And yet, when this started, they kicked out all foreign journalists out of China. And, oh, we've got it under control under China. In fact, our... Uh, our infection rate is so low, uh, it's not spreading anymore. We're going back to normal in some areas. Of course, there's no verification. All we have is the official propaganda given by the Communist Party and the dictatorship that they have there. So there's no way to check on it. But, oh, yes, uh, and our recovery rate, uh, pretty much everyone in China that gets it has recovered. We don't have people dying anymore. <laughs> the, the numbers that they give are so absurdly low, it, it, they can't be believed. But who do you believe? That's what all of these things, and, and, and to raise any of these questions, a lot of people, you're just a conspiracy theorist and stuff. No, I'm just an ordinary person with a lot of questions, but I know what God's word says. And I know that through all this, God's word is the only trustworthy thing through all of this. Uh, who, do we believe the communists? Do we believe the news anchor? Do we believe the doctors on TV that are saying opposite things? Do we believe the politicians? Maybe we just need to cast it aside and stick to God's word instead. So let's look here at what does the word of God say of all of these things. First, we see that God's word is the source of truth. That is the source of truth. Jesus defines truth in John chapter 17, his prayer. John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So there the Bible, the scripture is truth there. It is the only source of truth that we have in this world. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So there it is again called the word of truth, that the word is the source of truth. All the things around us, we've got fake news and we've got disinformation and we've got conflicting accounts and all of these things but we know the word of God is 100% and completely reliable. It is the source of truth. And probably the best thing any of us could do would be to turn off uh, the Facebook feeds and turn off the CNN and the Fox News and the cable news and all, turn all those off and just stick to God's word because we know it is absolutely reliable. Some more verses on that. Uh, there's Psalm 119, verse 160. 
psalmist writes, the entirety of your word is truth. So not just part of the Bible is true, or it doesn't just contain truth or a little bit of truth here. No, all of it, the entirety, entirety of your word is truth. Every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. So the Bible on everything it says. Now, God did not give the Bible as a science textbook, but when the Bible speaks about science, it's absolutely true in everything it says. The Bible is not a book about medicine, but everything the Bible says about medicine is absolutely true. The Bible is not a book of history, but everything it tells us through history and the historical events, that is absolutely true. The entirety of that word is true. Every part of it is true given by God. And of course, Jesus himself, John 14, 6, Jesus says there to the disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus, as the living word, he is the embodiment of truth, and he can be completely believed in every situation, everything the Bible tells us about him. It is all true from cover to cover, and everything that has, it said has happened in the past has happened, and everything it says is, that is going to happen in the future will happen someday. We know it is completely true in every part of it. And we also see what the Bible tells us, though, about people and about man's nature. It says in Psalm 116, verse 11, I said in my haste, all men are liars. All men are liars. So uh, what, the politicians wouldn't lie to us. The communists wouldn't lie to us. It, yeah, well, the Bible says all men are liars. That so you can, uh, I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said, you can fool you know, some of the people, you fool all the people some of the time. You can fool some of the people all the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. And I think that's what we have a lot, what's going on here. How much can we fool people? How much can we pull the wool over their eyes during this situation? When people are in panic and willing to give up everything, well, uh, the Bible tells us to watch out for that, to watch out for things that are, uh, that all men are liars and people are not trustworthy, every single one of us. Don't just take my word for it of go what is in the scripture. What does it say? Unfortunately, a lot of people, uh, if someone puts on a lab coat or, or acts like they're someone in authority, whether a news anchor, whether you know, they claim to be a doctor or a scientist, whatever, people just decide, yeah, whatever that person says, that's going to be true. You can take it to the bank, absolutely. And yet, we need to be skeptical of those things. You know, the Bible is the only absolutely, completely source of truth that is reliable in every part. People no matter how well-intentioned they are, all of us are susceptible to flaws and to mistakes. And a lot of Christian leaders and authors and things, unfortunately, get hung up on these things. Like in the scientific community, there's things called peer-reviewed. A lot of Christian speakers about marriage or about parenting, that they're all, uh, oh, you know, we did peer-reviewed studies about kids or about, you know, how your marriage turns out or about the peer-reviewed. It's got to be peer-reviewed, all these things, okay? A lot of people have no idea what the term peer-reviewed means. What they think it means is that, oh, this scientist uh, proposes some kind of theory or some kind of idea, and other scientists, they go out and they do the exact same thing. They harvest the same data, they go to the same place, take the same survey, whatever, do the same experiment and come up with the exact same results, and then when several have done that and it always turns out the same, then it's stamped peer-reviewed, it's approved. It, 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 the scientific community has come to consensus. No, that's not how it happens at all. When something is labeled peer-reviewed, what peer-reviewed actually means is that one scientist or doctor has an idea, he emails that to a couple buddies, and they read it, or a lot of times they don't even read it, they just skim it, and then they like, yeah, that sounds good, stamp it. Okay, I, I looked at it, peer-reviewed, it's good there. So a bunch of people agreeing in their opinion, that's what peer-reviewed means. Well, People can be wrong in their opinions, and people can be fallible. We live in a sin-cursed world where people, uh, our senses are marred by sin, and people will go to any lengths to excuse their sin and excuse their behavior, and so it's manipulated in these things, and so we see these deals, and it's, uh, you know, people also think that things like science and medicine are some kind of completely uh, objective, independent entity that's there just for the good of mankind. And they wouldn't dare harm people when the reality is the love of money brings corruption and is the root of all evil in these things. That when the, you know, scientific and medicine studies are paid for by big companies and big governments, that's who pays for those things. And surprise, surprise, the results of those studies agree with what that company and what that government wanted in the first place. And so you see, you know, oh, the oil company pays for this study that says, yes, using oil is great for the world. And then the solar 
panel industry, they pray for something that says, oh, oil is terrible for us. Well, you know, who do you believe? <laughs> they're both scientists and they're both there and they're both uh, serving their corporate overlords uh, in these things and producing the results that their sponsors want and all these things. So it's just a question, who do we believe? Who is the authority worth listening to? Well, let's stick to God's word of these things because men are fallible and uh, at all points, men uh, are susceptible to lying as the scripture warns us of. We also see, secondly, about God's Word that it is a knowable truth. It's not like the agnostic and those claim, it, oh, well, there's, there's truth out there. It's just so, it's beyond our comprehension. Yeah, there is a God. We just can't know Him. He's just so far off. No, the Bible is knowable. It's understandable. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23 says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. So it is knowable. We can buy it. We can attain the truth. The Bible's not written in some kind of high lofty language or, or complicated concepts where you have to have some kind of master's degree in literary arts and under, or understand any part of it. No, it's, most of the Bible's like on a second grade reading level. And so uh, it is very understandable. It is comprehensible to the ordinary person. It is there, and God wants that. He desires that. Psalm 51, verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Third John 1, verse 4, says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And so that God, he wants his people to be in truth, that he wants us to know that. He made it, he put it down on our level where we can understand it. And yet, in our world of postmodernism and all these terms where people say, well, the truth is just subjective. There is no, you know, there's no absolute truth. Well, you know, that's true for you, but that's not true for me. Or what, you can believe that, but I'm going to believe something different. That's not how the world works. That there is such a thing as an absolute truth. It is in God's word. God is the source of truth and he has revealed himself through his word. And it is in a way that we can know it and we can attain it. We can know what absolutes are. We can know that this is always right and this is always wrong. And there are morals and there are laws of the physical universe that God has put in place. We can know those things and we can understand and that God, he desires that and he wants us to know. And we see also about the word of God that it is an unchanging truth. And that's what a lot of people are just getting frustrated with this thing because they're hearing all these opposite accounts. Wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. Oh, it, this helps. This doesn't help. It, it's aggravating. A lot of people are just throwing their hands in the air like, who do we listen to? I don't care anymore. I'm just going to go about my life and things. But the word of God is unchanging completely in its truth. It was true back when God first gave those words to Moses and to Paul and the various writers. And it is still true today. It hasn't changed one bit. Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. So God's word is penned, it is settled, and it doesn't have to be amended, it doesn't have to be uh, ratified or, or re-edited or anything like that. It is there, and it is settled, and it is perfect in the way that God has communicated it to us, and it is not changing. Again, Jesus, the living word, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, today and forever. He is not changing one bit, and his word is not changing. It is established. It is settled there in heaven. When our first daughter, Abby, when she was born, uh, the common teaching that the hospitals and various things told parents, uh, peanuts, oh, you don't want your kids to be allergic to peanuts. And so uh, the best studies and everything show uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that uh, giving your kids before the age of one, when they're a little baby there, before age one, giving them any kind of peanut product, uh, you know, peanut butter, anything uh, there, any kind of nuts, whatever, giving that will lead them to a higher chance of having peanut allergies when they're older. So don't give your kids any kind of peanut things while they're little. You don't want them to get those allergies. Uh, so we, you know, we were good parents. You know, we, didn't, we didn't give our kids any kind of peanut things and stuff. <laughs> and then right about the time Avi turned one, all the studies changed, and they may have changed again since then, but at that time when Abby turned one, all the studies changed. Oh, uh, the new studies show, give your kids peanuts before age one. If you give them a couple things of peanuts, they'll be less likely to have peanut allergies when they're little. You want to expose them to peanuts. Ah, who do you believe? Who do you believe? And all the, it just doesn't, it keeps changing with all these things. And so it's aggravating. And a lot of people are just like, I'm done. I'm done with this. And yet that's what we see 
in the world around us. They say, oh, this doctor says, wipe your groceries down. This doctor says, don't wipe your groceries down. Who do you believe? Well, God's word is the only source that we can believe. It is the unchanging word. And yet through that, it, it's Christian's fault though, apparently. Did you know that coronavirus, if you're a Christian, coronavirus is your fault now? Uh, according to the New York Times, it is. New York Times article there for a May 20, or March 27th opinion piece, but you know, might as uh, well be uh, the official news, what they put out there, it says the religious light writes hostility to science is crippling our coronavirus response. So it is Christian's fault because they're having a, a little hard time of all this contradictory scientific, supposed scientific information hitting them. Well, which one do we believe? Well, it's your fault that coronavirus exists and that it's going around the world. It's Christian's fault. Christians, if you didn't know, Christians are to blame for every problem in the world, by the way. And uh, that's the current narrative from one uh, side of these things. And we see this, and it's out there, and uh, it's just whacking on Christians for all these things. Let's see what the Word of God says. Psalm 146, verse 5. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever. Keeps truth forever. God, he is truth and he is the source of truth and he has revealed that truth in his word and it is kept, it is sealed forever. It is not changing there. Uh, and you know, the New York Times, they want to bash on Christians, but it's not just Christians. It's just a lot of ordinary people are just tired of the nonsense and the disinformation and the fake news. And they're just, you know, I don't know who to believe, so I'm just not going to care. I'm just going to go on with life in these things. And, you know, far be it from the New York Times, it, it's got to be the fault of Christians. Well, let's completely ignore the fact that we've got Samaritan's Purse and then we've got other Christian organizations right there on the front line with field hospitals and various things set up in Central Park, just a few blocks from the New York Times headquarters that are there actually helping people on the front lines against coronavirus and against the other things. No, Christians are the problem. That is the narrative and that's what continues going on over and over and over again. And just the point like, it's not worth reading. It's not even worth acknowledging in these things. Not to compliment their things by even acknowledging it exists is just a waste of time. And we see so much of this nonsense here. And it's not, it, the Bible is not anti-science. A lot of people have these things, oh, you're anti-science. The Bible is not anti-science at all. The Bible encourages discovery. It encourages reason. Come, let us reason together, the scripture says. Proper science, there's no problem with that whatsoever. And what is proper science? Proper science is things that are observable in the present. We can observe it. We can repeat it. You can do the same uh, experiment, whatever. You pass electricity through water. It separates into oxygen and hydrogen. Any person in the world can do that. It's repeatable. It's observable. And it's verifiable. All these things. That's what true science is. And the, that has brought a lot of benefits to mankind. And the Bible is not against that. God wants us to discover things. Where we get into problems is when things have the label of science slapped onto them, but they're not observable. They're not repeatable. They're not verifiable. They're just people's opinions. You know, we don't have a time machine, so we can't go back in the past and see how these things came to be. Now, people, we can see what rocks and things look like in the present, but we can't go back in the past and say, well, this rock is a couple million years old. We weren't there. We can't observe it. We can't go back in the past and repeat it. We can't go forward in the future to look at all these things and stuff. All we can see is the present of these. And so, but we'd also have God's word. And when things that have the label of science on them conflict with God's word, well, we know that God's word tells us all men are liars. Uh, and we, with our faulty senses, we can interpret things the wrong way to excuse our own sin. And so when people under the guise of science say the earth is four and a half billion years old, well, that conflicts with God's word. I'm going to stick with God's word on those things. When they say Adam and Eve didn't really exist, man came from monkeys instead, that goes against God's word. I'm going to stick with God's word. When they say Noah's flood didn't ever exist in these things, I'm going to stick with God's word. And, and again, we're faulty. We, all we have is the present. We can observe things. We can repeat things. And yet the Bible also warns science falsely so-called. It warns against that. People try to use things of, uh, and it's really a battle of views there. Are you going to believe man's word? Are you going to put your, your trust in man's authority? Are you going to put your trust in God's word? I'm going to trust God's word, even if, it, even if I'm not going to be accepted or have my paper published or any of these kind of things or whatever, I'm going to trust God's word because, uh, you know, I know his is there forever and it's going to last for all time. And it, it's just aggravating these things when, um, 
and I know people aren't going to like some of these comments, but it's in the Word of God that uh, uh, you know, when my parents and my wife's parents, when they were in college, all the rage was global cooling. Oh, the planet's going to freeze. <laughs> we're going to, uh, so much pollution, all these things going to block out the sun. We're going to turn the planet into an ice ball. And then when I was a kid, it completely switched. It was global warming. Oh, we're going to burn up the greenhouse gases. We're going to burn to a crisp and all these things. And now it was global cooling. Then it was global warming. And now it's, it's neither. It's climate change. It's going to do something. It's going to get hotter. Or it's going to get colder. We don't know which, but it's going to do something <laughs> in these things. Well, uh, it's like, you know, who do you believe? And it just makes you skeptical of all these things. You know, do we believe this person? Do we believe that person? And, you know, it, if they could tell me what the weather was going to be and the temperature next year, you know, who are, they can't. And yet they can't, they want to tell us what it's going to be in 100 years down the future. Oh, in 50 years, it's going to be this much higher than, which for the record, I do believe in global warming. I am an absolute global warming believer. In fact, I believe temperatures on this planet are going to get hotter than even the most radical of tree huggers predicts and things there. Why? Because God's word says that. I believe in global warming, a different kind of global warming. First, our second Peter chapter three, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So yeah, it's going to get warm on this planet, going to get so warm, everything is going to be burned away and purged by fire. But so much of this... Mankind does not have the authority to destroy the world. God has put limits on the authority of things, and mankind is to take care of the world and to, you know, let's not destroy it, let's not catch all the fish, let's not cut down all the trees, you know, let's manage it properly, but mankind does not have the authority to destroy it. It is God's world, God own, owns it, and when he, he destroyed it once in Noah's flood, he's going to destroy it again when he comes back in the future, and that's on his timeline. He will do that in his, his proper place, and so it's not up to man. Man does not have the right or even the ability in God's view to make that happen, and so it, just, it changes. All, and people get, who've been around for a while, they're just like, you know, oh, here we go again. Now it's, it's a completely different thing. Take peanut butter. Don't take peanut butter for your kids. Oh, that, I'm just done. I, I'm done with all of it and these things. So God's word. God's word doesn't change. You can take it to the bank. Absolutely. We also see number four, God's word is the foundation, foundation for a true worldview. You need to build your life upon it. And those that build their lives on other things, that their lives crumble. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So a church that is accurately teaching God's word and presenting God's word to the people, it is a pillar of truth that is there. And people, they can build their lives there upon uh, not so much the church itself, but upon God's word. They're the truth that is presented through uh, the church accurately and the pastors that are teaching God's word. Now, churches that get away from God's word, that they go into apostasy, that go into cults or our various things, we're just going to run our church on public opinion or whatever it is, they've departed and they are no longer built on the truth. But those that stick to God's word, teach it accurately, teach it in its entirety, that that is the pillar of truth there. We can build our lives upon it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, describing the armor of God here, Paul says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, or the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And so that belt, truth was the belt that held the rest of the armor of God together. Your breastplate's going to be attached to the belt. Your sword, the scabbard, they're going to be hanging on the belt. All the various things. If you didn't have the belt, if you didn't have truth, everything would be flopping around and falling off. You could not go into battle without truth. And that's, we have to have God's truth there to be the anchor for the rest of our lives. Jesus speaks of this in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, or we'll actually look at Luke's version here, Luke chapter 6, verse 46, the, uh, the common story, the wise man and the foolish man. It says, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like, that he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream vehemently against the house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. However, verse 49, but he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth, or Matthew's gospel says on the sand, a poor foundation or without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. And so, it's the wrong foundation. And so many people, if you build your lives on the wrong foundation, 
Oh, it can last for a while. That house, it can look good. What a, what a wonderful house. Beachfront property <laughs> this guy has, but it's built on the sand. It has a shaky foundation, a foundation that is not going to last through the storms and through the tests. And it's what we see so much of the evil that is around us. It's not necessarily the actions that people do, but the problem is more the root. The problem is the foundation, the ideas that they are building their lives upon. And I'm not defending the Nazis and Hitler's regime under any stretch of the imagination. They did absolutely horrible things and some of the worst acts in human history. But the real problem was not so much with their acts, but with the foundation of their view. Their view was uh, Nazi, and people have amnesia about these things. Nazi, the German word for Nazi, national socialism. That's what Nazism stands for, national socialism. And yet today, uh, we want socialism, democratic socialism, or whatever term you slap onto it, okay? National socialism was the Nazis. Their worldview, their worldview was what's called social Darwinism. They believed in evolution, and they believed that that needs to be applied to the entire world. And they had scientists, they sponsored Hitler and his cronies, sponsored scientists to go around the world and find these proofs that uh, the Aryans are the superior race and all other races are inferior to them. And we found proofs and we found scientific backing and peer-reviewed studies that say we're right and all these things. And they did all that. And yet it's because their foundation was wrong of all the horrible things and the Holocaust and World War II and the death and suffering that that led to, they had a wrong foundation. Uh, there, and they were trying to apply that. And that's what we see. Why are people just panicking and losing their minds of so many things around here uh, with all that's going on? It's because the foundation of their life is under a storm right now. The stream is beating upon it, and the winds are blowing. And yeah, the house lasted for a while, but <laughs> is it going to come crumbling down? Well, it depends on what your foundation is. If your foundation is on, oh, big government's going to save us. Socialism is going to save us. Uh, uh, big science has got the answer. We got big corporations. They're going to be the answer. Communism's the answer. Whatever it is, if you've got a wrong foundation, yeah, those can last for a little bit, but they're, they're starting to show some cracks and starting to come down and we see the, it's starting to fall apart and it's beginning to crumble a little bit. That's why people are, are losing their minds with all these things uh, there. And, and you know, our, our political leaders of both sides believe, well, we just need more money. The Federal Reserve, six trillion here, another couple trillion here. We'll just print our way out of this problem with enough money. Uh, so much money, people can use it for toilet paper in a couple of weeks here by the time it's all printed and stuff. So much money out there, just plenty of money. We will print our way out of this problem. Well, if your foundation's on printing money and things, that foundation, it can last a bit, but it's going to crumble. It is sand that will pass away. And as the Bible says, it fell in the fall was great. And, and I'm worried we could be looking forward to a collapse of things coming in the days ahead because of terrible decisions that are going on right now. But we see these things. But all of that, you know, the, in, in the big scheme of things, this coronavirus doesn't really matter that much for eternity. What matters is God's word that is going to last forever and the truth that it teaches. And we see those that are Christians and those that have built their lives upon God's word, while it's not pleasant to go through these things, and, you know, it's not fun to be stuck at home with a bunch of kids or various things, and, and you know, it's challenging to go to the store and all the, while that's not fun, we don't have to panic because we know our lives are built upon the rock. And while we see everything crumbling around around us, we know why it's crumbling we, because we know their foundation is wrong and we know what their faith is in, whether you know, socialism or big government, whatever their faith is in, that is coming apart and that is not uh, working like they thought it would. And we can see why it's coming down, but we also don't have to be afraid because we know, yeah, it's a storm and it's unpleasant, but if our lives are built upon the rock and on God's truth, we're going to be fine and we're going to come through on the other side of this, that Jesus is still on the throne no matter what happens. And then lastly, with God's truth, we'll close with this, that God's truth, uh, the, the word of God, it tells us the true way to heaven. Lots of false ways out there, false man-made religions and working your way to heaven by this scheme and this system of all these cults and all these things around, but the Bible gives us the truth of those things of salvation. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So it is God's desire that people come to the truth and come to that knowledge of salvation. John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So that's the most important truth that the Bible reveals. It tells us exactly 
what our problem is. It tells us how we got here of Adam and Eve and their rebellion and sin coming upon all the world. It tells us those things. It tells us where the problem came from, but it also tells us the solution. It says that we're all guilty of sin, but that Jesus came. God became a man and came to earth and came and died on a cross. And even though I wasn't there 2,000 years ago to see it, and neither were you, but it's true because it's in God's word. And we have to believe in that testimony and believe in the record that we have there and believe and have that faith, we accept that if we will accept the forgiveness that God offers, that we can have salvation. And that is the only true way. Lots of other false ways and people trying to build their own way to heaven, but the gospel tells us the truth there in God's word that is only through the grace of God and only through faith that men can come to salvation. And so much, yes, uh, this is an unpleasant thing that we're in right now, but this will pass And in eternity, this really isn't going to make that much of a difference. But what will matter for eternity is God's word and the things that are going to last. And I'd rather put my life in things that are going to last for eternity. And we know who is on the winning side at the end. And we know God is going to come out on top and his word is the only thing that will last. And those that believe in his word and accept salvation, those are the only things that are going to last forever. And so we're going to close with this. If you uh, are not sure, if you're sitting at home and don't know about your Uh, salvation status, or if you don't know if you've ever come to Christ, or if you don't know if your life is built upon the rock, any of those things, feel free to call the church number. You can call Pastor Howard's cell number. You can email us, uh, Facebook, any of those things, and feel free to uh, get a hold of us. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word teaches us and uh, the freedom that we have to learn about it, even though we can't be together in person as we want to be, Lord, we can still communicate your word through the various means. And we thank you for uh, all your people, Lord. And we thank you uh, for those that are holding the line, those that are ministering to the sick through all of this. But Lord, uh, we just live in a world surrounded by disinformation and uh, the lies of the devil so much around us. So help us to filter out those things and to look to your word as the source of truth and to build our lives upon that truth. May you work in the hearts of our congregation I give your pastors and your shepherds wisdom of how best to minister through all this crisis. May it be with us, and may we be able to meet together again in person soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Truth is marching on, and it will not be stopped. a virgin Some think his miracles can be explained away